in our technology and structural inequality series. So today's topic is bias and discrimination in AI. So I think it's pretty clear at this point that AI and machine learning are in the process of fundamentally changing computing and society. And what's also clear is that so far this transformation has been, um, you know, somewhat problematic, at least for at least for some of us. And so today we have three amazing speakers to help us think through these issues. So I've had the pleasure of seeing all three of them give talks, and I've also had the opportunity to speak to them privately as well. And one thing that really struck me about all three of them, beyond of course their great achievements and their accolades and all the amazing things that they've done, is that they're really incredibly insightful. Um, so when it came time, uh, when it came time to organize this event, um, you know, it was quite obvious who we wanted um, to, to participate. So I'm going to introduce all three speakers now, and then we're going to move on to the um, uh, to the talk portion of the event. So our first speaker is Mutali Mkonde. So uh, she's the founder of AI for the People, which is a nonprofit communications firm that produces content that empowers general audiences to combat racial bias in technology. So before that, she was part of the team that introduced the Algorithmic Accountability Act, the Deep Fakes Accountability Act, and the No Biometric Barriers to Housing Act to the US House of Representatives. She recently published a fascinating study titled Disinformation Creep, ADOS and the Weaponization of Breaking News. When I first heard about this study, I was really blown away. Um, I think it really highlights, um, you know, I think Mutali really sort of identified a problem here that very few of us um, would have been able to see. So I was really excited about this work. Um, AI for the People also recently co-produced a film with Amnesty International uh, to support the Ban the Scan campaign, which is a global push to ban facial recognition. Um, our second speaker is, is um, Redia Rebebe, who is an assistant professor of computer science at UC Berkeley and a junior fellow at the Harvard Society of Fellows. So Radia got her PhD in computer science from Cornell. Her research is in AI and algorithms with a focus on equity and justice concerns. She co-founded and co-organizes Mechanism Design for Social Good, which has become a very influential multi-institutional and interdisciplinary initiative, and also Black in AI, which is a nonprofit organization that tackles equity issues in AI. Her dissertation receives numerous awards, including the 2020 ACM SIG KDD Dissertation Award. Uh, her work has informed policy and practice at the National Institutes of Health and the Ethiopian Ministry of Education. I also mentioned that she's been included in the MIT Technology Review's 35 Innovators Under 35 and the Bloomberg 50 list as one to watch. So our third speaker is Meredith, Meredith Broussard, um, who is an associate professor at the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute at NYU and the author of the award-winning book, Artificial Unintelligence, How Computers Misunderstand the World. Her research focuses on AI and investigative reporting and on using data analysis for social good. She's an affiliate faculty member at the NYU Center for Data Science and was a fellow at the Reynolds, Reynolds Journalism Institute. Her work has been supported by the Institute of Museum and Library Sciences at Columbia Journalism School. Um, and also she's been an editor at the Philadelphia Inquirer and a software developer at Bell Labs and the MIT Media Lab, which I'm pretty sure she's like the only person ever to have done that. Um, her essays have also appeared in numerous outlets, including The Atlantic, Slate, and Box. So um, yeah, welcome to the event. Um, Want to thank the speakers uh, for being here, and we'll start with uh, Mutali. Um, good, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here, and thank you, Professor Kamara, for inviting me. And I'm so excited to be with my colleague, my colleagues, uh, Reddit and but I'm sorry, uh, Reddit and Meredith. So um, I guess in starting, so my name is Natalian Conde. I am a journalist by training who ended up falling into technology around 2008 because at that time, advertising dollars were moving from newspapers and television, which is where my background is, and online. And I could see that my job was gonna finish pretty quickly. And somebody told me, I'm sorry, um, somebody told me that it was my mother. I'm going to turn off my phone. Somebody told me about this thing called Twitter and this guy called Barack Obama. And at the time, I didn't know Twitter and I totally thought a black guy with the middle name Hussein wasn't a thing, but I needed a job and they needed a communicator. And so I left. And that job really taught me so much about what it meant 
to be online, what it meant to create a persona online and what it meant to exchange ideas. And as somebody who's been a journalist and communicator for the last 21 years, that was incredibly exciting to me. So that job eventually led to another call um, where a friend was setting up Google's external affairs department and they were looking for somebody to communicate community agreement, um, community agreements between Google and the city of New York. And I was wor working really helping them liaise with community groups with nonprofits. So did that work and was really interested in black kids coding like my thing was and I said this in real life, like black kids have to code girls have to code boys have to code everybody has to code because one day we could be Mark Zuckerberg and if we were could all be black Mark Zuckerberg, then we wouldn't have race racism and we would have all of this money and um, obviously was wrong. And that's what led me to AI for the people. So I'm going to I'm going to spend a couple of minutes telling you about what AI for the people does, wh why we do it, why we're interested in commu um, computing for the people and black, you know, blacks and AI and others and kind of where we see ourselves in this ecosystem. So AI for the people is a communications firm. We use journalism, film, television and music to embed these ideas that technology not only has social meaning, but for black communities specifically can be the difference between life and death. It can be the difference between incarceration and freedom, and it can be the difference between further inequality or a more equal world. And because I was coming from through my Google experience, um, policymakers, those were the people that I spent most of my time talking to um, and telling them that technology was a good idea and everybody had to be Mark Zuckerberg, were really interested in policy with a big P and a small P. So big P being the acts that I've introduced and some of the work I'm going to speak about a bit later in terms of legislation here in the United States, and small P being some of the conversations that we're in with tech companies around their practices which are harmful and if they could just if we could just reframe those practices could be beneficial for other people and that's really I'm on the TikTok content advisory board and some work that we're doing about Twitter in relation to our disinformation work, which uh, resulted in myself and my co-workers being um, harassed and, and really uh, one of my co co-workers, co-authors was, um, you know, her, her private information put on the internet. So who are we? What do we do? And why do we use communication? Um, we're, like I said, we, it, like I said, in terms of our focus around policy, we work in two broad areas. One that we call race technology in the black body, which really looks at biometric technologies, but specifically their applied use within security environment. So we're really interested in carceral technology in policing technology in technology that's used to put people through the deportation pipeline as a black immigrant and African immigrant myself. I'm extremely sensitive to the ways that license place readers or facial recognition or gate gate technology can be used to identify vulnerable folks and then put them through more harmful systems. And that's some of the work that we're doing with um, Amnesty International and other legal partners. So we have everybody in that coalition from AI for the People, Amnesty, um, through to the Electronic Frontier Foundation and the ACLU. And then the other side of our work looks at information integrity. And in our information integrity work, this is really, really grounded in the work that I've done as a communicator and a journalist and how sourcing stories is such an important way to make sure that communities have accurate information. But what happens when your sources are algorithmically delivered and when information itself can get into what we now think of as filter bubbles? So in those two broad areas, we're always looking to, to move power and to build power, but specifically with graphics 
grassroots groups. We don't consider ourselves a grassroots group. We are way too uh, privileged and have way to sit with too many seats of access to take on those, those roles. But what does it mean to work with an NAACP as we're doing in Massachusetts? What does it mean to work with Citizens Action and Color of Change and Equality Labs as we're doing in New York? And what does it mean to work with on the ground groups in Minneapolis as they were thinking through how to uh, position policing and facial recognition just prior to, prior to this trial? And those are some of the questions that we, that we are looking to answer. Um, we are driven as a group by black feminist principles of care. So we're really grounded in the Kumbaya River Collective ideas around number one, that black women, but black people and by extension, all people are valuable. And so we'll be treated as such. Number two, that we have to look beyond capitalism and capitalistic structures if we're really going to save each other. So that really takes us out of some of the business models that we see that drive these technologies and, and push us into critique. And then number three, that we can change. And that becomes extremely important to us because when we are speaking to policymakers or when we are speaking to companies, often, even though that's the drive of our work, we have to um, we have to kind of wrap it up in other uh, other packaging for acceptability. And so I'm really interested as I'm speaking with my colleagues about the communication barriers that they sometimes face when they're trying to create and push power. So one of the things I did prior to starting this organization was to try and get a measure of what would it mean for technologists, for computer scientists to have some level of racial literacy and wrote a report with colleague, my colleague Jesse Daniels, who's a sociologist at the City University of New York, and my colleague Dara Kinshin Mir, who's a computer science professor at Bucknell University. And we thought about racial literacy in three three kind of terms. We thought, what would it mean for computer scientists, both in industry and the academy, to really understand, as um, Cornel West left us with, that Black race matters, that the history and the politics of being Black in this country become encoded into all our systems off and online, and that is going to impact how those systems how those systems land with those communities. So that was the first body of work in terms of this idea of racial literacy. The second was what do we do with that information emotionally? So once we have given that information to our teams, how do we build the emotional rigor to ensure that race mattering and because race matters, we're gonna to have to shift resources and we're going to have to shift power to impacted groups so that they can co-create solutions. How do we get around what Robin D'Angelo would call white fragility? And for those who don't know, this is the, the defense mechanisms that come into play when matters of race are raised as determinative, fa determinative factors within a conversation. And then number three, within this racial literacy cycle, what is your action plan? And initially our action plan was, I had all of these, um, I was extremely networked in state in state houses across the country, as well as DC. We're just gonna do briefings. We're just gonna write white papers. We're gonna introduce bills. They're gonna get out of committee. And then we're gonna have, we, we're gonna have changed the you know the landscape and even though using networks we were able specifically to get to the hill in the house of representatives and and enter bills what we weren't able to do was move bills and the reason we weren't able to move bills is that there was a literacy gap and a communications gap and that communications gap is why ai for the people realized that we can't have in-house conversations with law with lawmakers and companies unless we're having outside conversations with organizers and grassroots groups and as my really good friend um rashad robinson would say from color of change he said you need somebody at the table and you need to you need a crowd at the door 
if we want to move power in this country. So we decided, or I decided to go back to my roots, go back to filmmaking and go back to journalism and start to create these narratives that don't just point out the problem, but actually speak to a solution, speak to this better future that we can co-create with each other because we are in this computerized world and, and not only speak to this better future, but make sure the most impacted working class voices, folks that had been targeted by the police, folks that really know what this, what this issue is, would be our messengers as we did this work. And because our work is so focused on policy, we had to do it in between two to 27 minutes. So two minutes if we just want to get a staffer to get us into the call to have the screening, five minutes for the screening, because five minutes is about the attention span of policymakers. And when we were doing white papers, we only read the abstract and then we go right to the recommendations because we have so little time to make our case. And then we knew that after that five minutes of content, we could potentially have days, weeks, months, hopefully years of conversation, hopefully not years of conversation to move a single bill, but we could start to build that pressure within state houses to make these changes. And so I'm hoping, and I know that Meredith will speak about the documentary that she's a part of, which we're extremely excited about, because what we're thinking is that the more of these pieces of art that keep showing up, the more we're gonna get that repetitive message the more repetition, the more power we can build. And that's really where AI for the people, where the rubber hits the road. We want to build the power needed to make sure that racial justice isn't just, isn't just analog, but it's embedded into the technological decisions that are being made in our society. So I'm looking um, at my notes just to make sure that I'm on track. So. I mean, as I begin to close out, I'm going to do two things, tell you where we're headed and then just show you a trailer of a video that we made with Amnesty International. So Amnesty is partnering with um, folks on the ground. Most of us are policymakers, we're lawyers, we're movement people to push through bands of facial recognition in four key locales across the across the world. So one is New York City. AI for the People has actually extended that to New York State. One is New Delhi, one is Alambatar, and the other is the West Bank. And in all of those places, facial recognition is being used, uh, being weaponized against the most vulnerable people um, in that community. So in the US context, we're looking at low income black and brown folks, but obviously that, that changes as we go across the world and meanings of race change. And within that campaign, we've identified, at least in the New York instance, a law that has been drafted, S79, that was introduced to the internet committee um, and New York State, State um, the New York State Senate. And the thing that's really interesting about the Internet Committee was prior to us showing our film, Eric Schmidt had been really interested in meeting with the Internet Committee and, and talking about how we can have COVID trackers, we can have COVID vaccine passports, and we can have all of these different ways of reshaping New York as we recover from COVID. And what we're hoping to do with that bill is not just use this film, but use our activations um, across six months, um, use other, use dance and culture and film, all of these things that we think about as being key to New York City, key to New York City culture, but really in all of these returnable social actions and, and communications actions, really helping people think about what would the world look like if we didn't have police? But also beyond that question, do you know that your police have technological weapons that are not only a threat to your human rights, but are also a threat to um, your civil rights? And if we are going to be 
if we, if we are going to be a racially just community, we shouldn't just stop at banning a technology. We should also look at these underlying systems that allow for for that harm to be to be perpetrated. So, in closing, I just want to invite you to look at a thirty. I think it's a fifty second clip of the film that we're taking, not just across state houses and um, to lawmakers in the federal government, but we're, we're sharing with movement so that they can start to think about, if I have a meeting and I know my meeting's 30 seconds and I want to do something really quick, what can I show people? And this was our contribution to that. I was looking out of my bedroom windows and there was officers in my patio area. One was holding his holster like this and the other had a long gun. That escalated it quite a bit. Surveillance has always been a thing, particularly within black and brown communities. All you're seeing is a nuanced tool on an age old problem. It does not make me feel safe for my son. I don't want his biometric data in some system from when he was four years old. Facial recognition is so new that there's not enough research or laws behind how this is implemented. And until then, we should limit our usage because it can be damning. And for folks that are interested, we have the longer five minute film that goes much deeper into those case studies and I can put the website where the video lives in the chat. So thank you for inviting me. That's just a, a small part of our work. Great, thank you. That was great. Um, all right, so next, uh, the next speaker is going to be um, ready yet. Unmute me. All right, is this working? You can hear me and see me and all. Okay, I'm gonna assume the silence means yes. Um, thank you so much to um, Sandy Kamara and to everyone for putting this together. It's really wonderful to see all the amazing work that CSR, uh, CSREA is doing. And um, and really thank you to Sandy for all that you do with uh, Competing for the People, which has been um, really a, an, an inspiration for me and sort of I see it as a sort of sister organization to some of the things that I've been involved in. So I, I really appreciate being here and um, I'm also really excited to share this uh, virtual stage with uh, the other speakers. And I really wanna echo something that Mutali said, which is that a lot of these changes that we need and we are fighting for involve a sort of um, a sort of ecosystem, right? You need some people at the table, some people you know, banging at the door, wherever it is that we need to be. Um, and uh, I wanna share with you a little bit about the, the small role that I've been able to play in some of, um, some of the conversations that are happening that I think are sort of um, somewhat long overdue and I think needed. So um, I'll start with uh, the sort of 2015, 2016 um, time era, let's say, it seems like it was about a century ago. Uh, that was around the time when I started graduate school and it also co coincided with the time when um, the computer science community, especially the academic computer science community, got really interested in questions of fairness and bias and, and you know, uh, kind of related topics, right? So you can see, for instance, you know, if you're looking at uh, uh, preprints or papers that are on this topic, you really see the kind of the, the bottom of the exponential growth around this time, right? And it really kind of exploded. And it was really exciting for me to be starting grad school at the time. I knew I wanted to do something that involved um, uh, both sort of mathematical work, which was my background, more computational work, which was I, which is something that I was starting to get interested in more and more, and also something that impacts society. And I mean, what was more relevant than talking about things like uh, risk assessment tools and things like that. And so I was really excited. Um, but I was also sort of really disappointed in the beginning. I was reading these papers and I felt like, they didn't quite capture, um, especially the sort of the more um, uh, theoretical papers and more technical papers. I was excited that they were there. I think that they were capturing something important, but it didn't quite go very far, right? It didn't go far enough. And I, um, I remember having actually conversations with my advisor, who was author of one of these uh, uh, papers, that ended up being very influential at the time, but I felt wasn't actually going um, 
uh, it wasn't doing at all that I wanted it to be doing, right? Um, it, this was a paper that was uh, focused on sort of how um, uh, sort of very common definitions of fairness might be incompatible with one another in most uh, cases that you'd be thinking of, except for like very narrow um, settings where where you could actually achieve all three things, right? And so I, I felt like these impossibility results were it was good to know, but I, I felt like it didn't quite go uh, as far as I wanted it to go. And I felt like the discussion around it was um, uh, completely sanitized in some sense, right? And so I remember having a conversation with my advisor and I decided, you know, to extend grace at the time because I thought, look, you know, this is a field that um, hasn't really thought about societal impact in the way that it really should. And so this is kind of the beginning stages and maybe things uh, will change over time. And over time, I think my patience has, uh, uh, I've, I've been extending less and less grace, let's say, and I think I've been less and less uh, patient with what's going on, right? Because in some sense, I felt like um, there's, uh, there's obviously exceptions to this, but in some sense, I felt like we sort of got stuck in that space, right? We sort of got stuck in this space of, well, we can define certain things and we can sort of mathematically analyze them, maybe computationally analyze them. Uh, and then they'll tell us something and, you know, kind of hopefully we'll sort of like optimize our way out of this. We'll, we'll kind of like uh, change our definitions or whatever it is that we need to do kind of mathematically uh, to, to get our way out of this. And that's clearly not uh, that's clearly not going to work, right? And so um, this is a pretty kind of uh, narrow, narrow thing that I, I'm, I'm mentioning, I'm about to mention to you now, but I, I do think that it's sort of emblematic of the kind of work that, uh, that I think is also important in this space, which is that, um, uh, so there's a recent paper that I have with my colleague, Max Casey, where we took these um, very common definitions of fairness that people have worked with, and we thought critically um, about ways in which they fall short. Right, and so we have a paper called uh, "Fairness, Equality, and Power in Algorithmic Decision Making," which looks at these um, definitions of fairness um, and looks at uh, three three limitations that we think are incredibly important important that that we think are missing, at least in these sort of very popular definitions of fairness. Um, the first one is that uh, these definitions um, kind of get you to a space where you think that it's actually totally uh, legitimate and okay to, to have an equality if it's justified by merit, right? And I'll put merit in quotations here because um, oftentimes the person who gets to decide what merit is, is someone who uh, is the decision maker, right? So this is often uh, a very powerful entity, a corporation, a powerful individual, whoever it is, right? So someone who's powerful gets to decide what this merit is. And often we look at that and we think about uh, issues of bias and fairness as sort of deviations uh, uh, from that kind of perfect prediction that you might have to that merit. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, let's say that you're thinking about hiring and you have some position, let's say that you're thinking about where uh, warehouse workers and you would like to hire the people who are the most productive and you're like, okay, well, I think what I'm going to look at is people who can work the longest hours, right? And so you might say, well, look, you know, past data about how long people work might have this, this information missing and that other information missing. And, you know, when you predict, actually, maybe you do a worse job for some groups of people, whatever, you know, uh, sort of issue of fair, uh, fairness and bias arise here. And as a result, we really focus on that. But it really doesn't take that much to kind of step back and say, wait, is that actually okay? Is it actually okay for us to only want to hire people who can work the longest hours, right? You know, uh, labor rights be damned in this situation, right? And of course, in this situation, I think those of us here would agree, no, that has a lot of issues, right? Um, and what, why is that something that we've decided is, is completely okay to discriminate by? If someone is not able to work extremely long hours, taking very few breaks, uh, if any, uh, then, then maybe that's not actually the world that we want to live in, a world that would not give a person that job, right? And a lot of the other examples that you might think of that feel reasonable to you, where the definition of merit um, feels maybe potentially reasonable to you, it's not. Um, it's often not very hard to kind of really sit with it and try to pro problematize it if you're someone who's you know more on the optimistic side of these things, right? Um, so that was one limitation that we wanted to highlight, which is that um, we focused on sort of. Uh, our inability to maybe predict some 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 kind of uh, some label or something here uh, consistently across groups, but actually we really need to also ask questions around. Well, um, it, are we actually okay at, uh, with having inequality uh, perpetuated by uh, at, um, again also kind of uh, often gets lost in um, in discussions? Is that oftentimes our discussion ends up being very narrowly bracketed, right? So we often look at some algorithm that's deciding something, right? Let's say uh, it is, um, uh, uh, 
you know, admission to colleges, right? And so we're looking at this algorithm or a, a decision maker, let's say even a person, right? Uh, that's making some definition about who gets to go to a particular college or not. And we look at the population that's entering that particular system, right? And we look at definition, uh, 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 decisions that we're making within that kind of box. But, but of course, in reality, um, the people who are, we're looking at are only a subset of a broader population. Uh, they, they've had very different backgrounds coming into, come, arriving at that point. And the decision that we're making is also part of a broader ecosystem, right? You go to college, but of course you go to, you might go to different colleges, you might go do internships, you might go get jobs, you might go, any number of things will happen outside of that, right? And so these questions that we're looking at are embedded within a much broader uh, system of decisions and within a much broader society. And so if you're really pretending like this box is kind of existing in, in, in oblivion and sort of a vacuum, these people are really the only people that exist out in the world, then maybe, okay, it makes sense to have one definition of fairness or a couple of definitions of fairness and really focus on exactly what you can do within that space. But of course, that's not the case, right? We really need to think about um, the impact that that decision has on the broader society overall um, and also inequalities that might have uh, been impacting people up until that point when they get to that point, right? And so an example of this would be uh, something like affirmative action, right? We, we, we don't have affirmative action out of thin air. It exists for a particular reason. It acknowledges the sort of oppression certain groups of people have faced um, uh, getting to the point of, say, applying to uh, to colleges, and also acknowledges that uh, there's sort of historic uh, oppression that uh, makes um, makes a lot of things difficult, right? You know, if you graduate from college, uh, let's say you don't get a job for six months, do you do you have, uh, you know, can you go and like kind of live with with your with your parents for six months while you look for a job, right? And so it acknowledges this much broader structural. Uh, issue here, right? But of course, if you're only looking at this uh, very narrowly bracketed uh, uh, setup where you're just looking at the people who entered, uh, call, applied to colleges and you're making a decision there, then it looks like it's, you know, discriminating in favor of people that are uh, that are actually on the, in the marginalized group. And that's not the case, right? And so um, oftentimes the discussions that we have here are not that far from, you know, from what I just described, right, in terms of how uh, narrowly bracketed they are. And the last thing I want to mention is um, that uh, oftentimes we focus on um, uh, you know, some number of categories. Let's say we look at gender or we look at race, or maybe we even look at the intersection, right? Okay, this is like as far as we've, uh, we've, we've gotten sometimes, right? And we look at differences that exist between these groups uh, or intersections of groups that we're looking at. But of course, there's many, many more intersections that really matter here, right? So when we think about intersectionality, for instance, gender and race are not the only things that matter, right? We know this, I think if we go back to sort of uh, some of the classic papers here, uh, if we look at actually um, some, some papers that are often not discussed, right, by, um, uh, uh, so there's a lot of African uh, women scholars that talk about, uh, uh, you know, what, what they call weird, right, which is the, uh, I forget, what, what exactly what it stands for, right? But it also acknowledges the sort of the geographic component to it. You live in ur urban or rural regions. Um, we know immigration status matters. We know that we know all these things. Class matters. All these things matter, right? And so, it's 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 not um, hard to think of examples whereby you know if I gave you only a small number of groups, right? Let's just say I'm only looking at race, or I'm only looking at gender and race, or maybe uh, maybe I add one more thing, right? And and I I figure out a way whereby I can sort of minimize um, uh, minimize differences between groups, right? And so so I feel much better about it. Um, but of course, you know, you can add a bunch of other groups that we also know matter. And then once you look at that intersection, maybe you actually have a significant inequality, right? So for instance, you know, we think about like, um, uh, let's think about like, let's say, you know, we're thinking about the gender uh, pay gap, right? We know that uh, the gender pay gap is actually significantly off obfuscated if you're not considering race. But what if you're also, uh, if you're adding class, right? Well, how, um, uh, you know how much is the is the gender uh, is the is the pay gap if you're looking at uh, low uh, low income or, or like you know so lower class uh, black woman versus um, you know higher income black woman right is is there more of a gap between these two groups and so on right and so what we argue in this work is um, effectively that look you know fairness definitions at least the kind of the popular ones that we looked at here they do something it was a good um, it was a good it was a good starting point right but we really 
really need to shift away from uh, these, these types of um, arguments now to, uh, to questions that involve um, uh, that involve an inequality and power-based perspective. So I'll drop a link to the paper here if you're interested in taking a look. And there's uh, some some general audience pieces that we're writing um, on this that uh, that will also come out. So if you're if you're interested, you know you can take a look in a couple of weeks or something, right? So uh, this is something that we argue. And um, much of my work actually is and is focused not on kind of bias and fairness in this uh, in this way that I've mentioned, but but really in um, uh, what we can do uh, to use computational techniques to uh, improve improve um, improve the lives of marginalized and disadvantaged groups, right? So um, I'm one of the co-founders of the Mechanism Design for Social Good Initiative, which, as I mentioned, has been really deeply inspired by uh, Sandy's work here, and I, I has been uh, has I see it as a sort of kind of sister organization to. To, to the work that you are doing, Sunny. And so um, in this initiative, what we've done, it's been in existence for about five years now. What we've done is to really uh, uh, do things in a very bottom up way. It's a mostly academic community. We also have practitioners uh, to, do, to do things in a bottom up way where we first try to understand what problems exist out there, right? We really engage with domain experts and impacted individuals in that space. And then we see whether um, uh, algorithmic and optimization and mechanism design techniques um, uh, informed by other uh, disciplines have anything positive to contribute here, right? And so if the answer is no, then that's no, we move on. But uh, but we often find that there is some role that you can play here. Um, uh, maybe it's not going to be the most central or important role, but there is some role that the set of techniques that we have and that I love uh, can actually play, uh, play um, uh, they can play a positive role in this space. And so um, I'll drop a link to the organization if you're interested in taking a look or if you want to join it. Uh, it's a very... Um, it's a very open community. Um, it's been that way for you know five years, and it'll continue that be, to be that way for uh, hopefully a long time to come. And the last thing I'll mention is that um, this initiative has had a workshop series for uh, for you know the entire time that we've been around. We had the fourth one last summer, which is really uh, amazing. And actually, we have a. Uh, there are a lot of innovative things that the program chairs of the workshop did last summer, uh, Francisco Marmolejo and Fedra Monachu. Um, they, they had like one day that was um, uh, mostly in Spanish and there was live captioning uh, to English to Spanish all the whole time, the whole workshop. And one of the days was mostly in Spanish and um, uh, and it was just really amazing. It was in recognition of the fact that we have a massive sub-community within the Latin, uh, Latin America region. And so uh, it, what we've done this year is we've been able to kind of grow that stand uh, that's uh, that standalone workshop into a, a full a full fledged um, ACM conference. Um, it's called we, we renamed it to capture the scope of the community. We renamed it to uh, equity and access and algorithms optimiz uh, mechanisms and optimization uh, or EAAMO or pronounced emo. So uh, there was a discussion that we might play emo music in between in between talks. We'll see if that actually happens. But you know, if you if you all are interested in that, then maybe you can put in a vote when I put this up uh, with the executive committee, people were less excited. So, um, but we're very excited about this, um, with this conference. And the reason why I'm, I'm personally really excited is that um, it, we're, we get to build on all these things that we've learned from other conferences, from our own workshop series. Uh, and we've been able to do a couple of things that I think are uh, uh, potentially very useful. So we have uh, a call for uh, a call for participation. It has a research track, which has a lot of the more traditional papers that you'd expect to see um, at conferences. Although you know our our workshop has always been very um, interdisciplinary. We have you know it's like a third you know economists, a third you know uh, uh, like computer scientists, and you know a third like operations research sociologists, and so on. And I've really always enjoyed that. Um, but we also have a second track called uh, Call for uh, uh, Policy and Practice. And so there we have submissions that I haven't often seen in, at other conferences, right? So there's data set submissions, right? You know, collecting good data is really very hard um, uh, and making that available is really a huge service to uh, the research community and broader communities, but often gets, um, uh, it doesn't often get recognized. And so we're very excited about that. Um, uh, there's also demos, um, uh, which you know I've seen at other conferences as well. But you know it's always exciting to uh, to, to build on people's best ideas. Um, so I was excited that we were able to add that. And something I was really really excited about. It seems small, but you know to me this is like maybe the most fun thing that we're doing here is um, uh, we're also including. Uh, uh, problem pitch submissions, right? So um, oftentimes, especially within the computer science community, we feel like. Uh, 
we haven't done anything if we if we haven't solved something right we're very we're very obsessed sort of with this idea of solving stuff and the reality is you don't ever solve anything you maybe make progress um and the and the and the and even harsher reality but i think an important reality is that identifying the a good question itself is is a very huge part of the process right maybe you identify a very good question that actually will make uh, will make a difference and then the solution doesn't look um, all that complicated or, or all that technical right and this is the sort of the uh, the thing that's like a huge problem in the computer science community if it's not you know technical and technically sophisticated then it's not interesting and that's of course not true and so what we wanted to do was to create a space whereby uh, people who've gone out into communities into organizations into wherever it is that they that they wanted to go out into and really learn about that space and really try to understand what are some good questions that we can ask here uh, that that work also gets acknowledged and we've had some submissions that are problem pitch like submissions in the past um, and they've been you know some of my favorite submissions and uh, we're really kind of doubling down this year and trying to build on that and so I'll drop a link to this conference uh, submission deadlines are in about two months um, at the beginning of June the conference is happening virtually in October um, and there's information on the website we're going to be announcing the invited speakers um, uh, very shortly and I'm incredibly excited about the speakers that we're going to have um, so check that out and check out MD4SG and check out the paper that I'm going to drop. And um, thank you for listening to me. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you, Radia. That was great. And yeah, please make sure to check out the chat with all the links. There's like links getting dropped, you know, all throughout with awesome, awesome information. So um, yeah, make sure to check that out. And uh, so the last talk is going to be uh, Meredith. Okay. Uh, thanks, Sunny. Uh, thank you, Sunny. Thank you, Brown. It is so exciting to be here today, uh, and especially uh, with these other esteemed panelists. Uh, so I am going to follow the other panelists and talk a little bit about how I got into this work and also what I'm doing now. Uh, so what do I do? Um, I am a data journalism professor. Uh, data journalism is the practice of uh, finding stories in numbers and using numbers to tell stories. Uh, I got into it because I started my career as a computer scientist and quit to become a journalist because computer science was too racist and sexist for me. Uh, and I fortunately got back into computer science uh, through journalism. Uh, because the media industry uh, at long last uh, kind of got a little bit more computational, uh, which was thrilling. So now what I do is uh, I do a lot of work on AI ethics and I got to that because I used to say, oh, what I do is I build AI tools for investigative reporting because I spent a long time doing that. But I discovered that I would go to say cocktail parties and I would say, oh, I build AI tools for investigative reporting. And people would say, oh, you mean you like build a robot reporter? I would say, no, that sounds awesome, but that is not what I do. And they would say, all right, so you mean you build a machine that spits out story ideas? I would say, no, that sounds awesome, but that is not what I do. So I realized there was a lot of confusion about what AI is and isn't. Uh, so I started explaining AI in plain language, uh, in part so that I could have conversations at cocktail parties, but also because as uh, Mutelli pointed out, uh, we need literacy around AI. And the way that we talk about artificial intelligence in the computer science and the math community is often impenetrable. And when people think that AI is something that they have to kind of sit back and let happen to them, uh, that undermines democracy. So I care a lot about building computational literacy, about building AI literacy so that people can be empowered uh, to have a voice in the decision making process. And this is particularly acute around the issue of facial recognition. Uh, facial recognition should not be used in policing. Uh, this is the subject of, as Michelle mentioned, a new documentary called Coded Bias. Uh, which I am pleased to say that I am in and is based in part on my work. Uh, it's coming to Netflix on Monday. It's currently streaming on PBS. Uh, I hope you'll check it out because uh, it, well, it's just a really good film uh, full of amazing researchers, primarily women, primarily people of color. Uh, and 
takes you inside uh, the major civil rights issue of our time. Right. Uh, so another thing that I want to talk about today is something that I am working on uh, as part of my new book. So I'm writing a new book called More Than a Glitch, How to Make Technology Less Racist, Less Sexist, and More Accessible to All. Uh, I don't entirely have all the answers yet because I haven't finished writing the book, but uh, one of the things that I am writing about is the ideas of bias and fairness. Because bias and fairness, as Redia told us, are uh, very much under discussion in the computer science community nowadays. Uh, and when I think about fairness and how machines think about fairness or how machines determine fairness, one of the things that I think about is I think about a cookie. So when I was a kid and there would be one cookie left in the cookie jar in my house, my brother and I would fight over who got the last cookie, right? Totally, totally typical. If you have siblings, you have been in this exact fight. Uh, and so there's a difference between the mathematical way you would solve this problem and the social way you would solve this problem. So if you asked a computer, what do you do about the problem of the last cookie? The computer, which is a machine that does math, of course, the computer would say, okay, well, you divide the cookie exactly in half and each child gets 50%. And there's no fight, there's no problem. That's how you deal with it. And that's absolutely true. That is a mathematically fair decision. But in the real world, when you divide a cookie in half, there is a big half and a little half. And if I wanted the big half, I would say to my brother, okay, you give me the big half now and I will let you pick the TV show that we watch after dinner. And my brother would think for a second and he would say, okay, that sounds fair. And everybody would be happy, right? So this was a socially fair decision. And it is also totally legitimate, right? So both ways of solving the problem are legitimate. Both ways are accurate, both ways are fair, but they are fair in different contexts. So mathematical fairness and social fairness are not the same thing. Computers can only compute mathematical fairness, and therefore we should be really cautious of using computers to solve social problems. Okay. So that is, uh, that is fairness. Uh, let's talk a little bit about bias. Okay. Uh, I do not have slides, but I do have a prop for you was thinking about the different definitions of bias. Uh, and one definition of bias that we don't often talk about, it comes from fabric, actually. Uh, bias is a line diagonal to the grain of a fabric. Right? And this definition of bias is not considered quite as legit because it's about sewing, it's about textiles, which is traditionally coded as feminine, but we should examine that and we should talk about the multiple meanings of bias. Okay, so what are the more computational meanings of bias? Uh, well, the computational meaning of bias, if you ask a statistician, is that uh, bias is the deviation of the expected value of a statistical estimate from the quantity it estimates. Uh, bias may be a systematic error introduced into sampling or testing by selecting or encouraging one outcome or answer over others. Uh, in the Q&A, uh, we can ask Seni about uh, what's the, how statisticians talk about bias. Uh, and these are uh, important and valid definitions, right? But if you're talking to say a sociologist, you're gonna get a different definition of bias. A sociologist is going to say, well, bias is a personal and sometimes unreasoned judgment. It is prejudice, right? All of these definitions are valid, are true, but the meaning of the term is context specific. And so what we have right now is we have increasingly good computational tools for identifying mathematical fairness 
or statistical bias. We do not have good computational tools for the other dimensions of bias for identifying prejudice, for example. Uh, and so the kind of discrimination and bias that we're talking about when we talk about white supremacy is much more difficult to detect in data and in data sets. And inside computer science and mathematics, there's actually a lot of resistance to admitting that these things exist. Uh, there's resistance to admitting that uh, that computers are not objective or unbiased, right? There's this kind of pro-computation uh, agenda, which is something that I call techno-chauvinism. It's the idea that computers or mathematical solutions are superior to all other solutions. What I would argue instead is that it's about what is the right tool for the task. Sometimes the right tool for the task is a computer. Sometimes the right tool for the task is something simple like a book in the hands of a child sitting on its parent's lap. One is not superior to the other. Okay. So we need to push back against techno chauvinism if we're going to find the root causes of bias and discrimination that are harmful inside computational systems. Uh, we also need to push back against some ideas in mathematics of hundreds of years of excluding people based on uh, a belief in the purity of mathematics. Uh, the idea that it's just math, that you can succeed in math if you, know, if you just do the math, like that it's not about other factors, is a belief that camouflages a range of structural discrimination. Uh, and it dates back hundreds of years. So we need to examine what's going on in academic math and computer science. Uh, we need to examine what's going on in the technology industry, which has inherited all of the biases of academic computer science, which has inherited all the biases of academic math. Uh, we need to go back to the source and really examine a lot of the core beliefs and uh, get rid of the structural barriers. So dismantling the system requires action on a lot of fronts. We have to do a lot of things. We have to do individual movement. We have to do policy movement. We have to educate. We have to make media. We have to write academic papers. We have to do a lot of things. Fortunately, we don't all have to do all of these things all at once. Uh, we join forces to do them. Uh, and as you get into your journey of dismantling the system and making a difference, uh, I recommend looking at one frame uh, that has been offered by Ruha Benjamin in her book, uh, Race After Technology. And this is the idea that computational systems or automated decision-making systems discriminate by default. Right. So for a very long time, we've had this techno chauvinist idea that, oh, a computer system is more objective or more unbiased. And Ruha Benjamin offers a different interpretation. And she says, how does it change if we assume that a system is discriminating? Because we know that the world is full of a range of structural discriminations. We know that the world is racist and sexist and ableist and uh, there is not enough trans and non-binary visibility in the world. How about if we take that knowledge and we go into our evaluation of technical systems with this knowledge and we assume that the system is discriminating as opposed to assuming that this, the system is pure. You know, we assume the system is discriminating and then we look for the ways that the system is working against people in order to do a better job of deciding well, should we actually be using this system at all? Or is it perhaps easier to reform the human-based system before we start automating systems and encoding biases and inequality in code? Uh, so that's what I have for today. Uh, I have fairness and bias and discrimination uh, and cookies 
and discrimination by default and how do we think and talk about all of these very important issues. So thank you very much. Thank you, Meredith. Um, so thank you, you know, to all the speakers for these really thought provoking and um, insightful, insightful talks. So we're gonna move towards, uh, we're gonna move to the Q and A part of the event. So please use the, um, there's the Q and A feature if you have questions. But uh, since I'm moderator, I'm gonna basically start. You know, this is like my dream team of panelists on this subject. So, you know, I'm gonna take advantage of it. Um, so, you know, so I think it's clear that, that machine learning and AI, right, are, as I mentioned in the introduction, are, are transforming society. And um, there's a lot of excitement about you know, all the different potential applications, you know, self-driving cars and, and drones that are going to do all kinds of, you know, great things and all the, you know, all kinds of sort of ideas. And a lot of these, these applications are coming from our community, you know, the community, computer scientists, by the way. Um, but one thing that seems, you know, at least from my vantage point that, that I'm observing um, is that from the point of view of people of color and of marginalized communities, it seems like AI and machine learning really has more harms or it's causing more harms than positive outcomes. Um, and so my first question is like, is this true or am I just like not seeing things correctly? And if it is true, why do you think this is the case? Well, Sunny, I think you're very much, uh, you're very much right. Uh, the AI systems and machine learning systems that are being built are not being built with the needs of people in co of color in mind. And one of the things that these systems are doing is they're including the existing biases in the world in these computational systems, making these biases and these uh, ways of uh, you know, these types of prejudice and these problems harder to see and even harder to eradicate. Uh, so the case of self-driving cars is a particular, particular soapbox of mine. I think self-driving cars are a terrible idea. Uh, I have gone on record about this any number of times. Uh, and so one of the things I'm really concerned about with self-driving cars is that self-driving cars have the same kind of uh, image technology that facial recognition technology uses, okay? Like there are, we could get into the nitty gritty of it, of it computationally, but let me super simplify it. It's the same kind of thing. And it all stems from, all of this computer vision stuff stems from uh, early image work uh, in photography, okay? Computer vision is built on top of what we know about photography. Okay, what do we know about photography? Well, if you go back to the early years of Kodak, uh, Kodak film, color film, was optimized for white people, right? Uh, if you are a person of color, you did not look good in uh, color photography until the 1970s. And the reason for this was Shirley cards. Uh, so Kodak would send these cards that had uh, a picture of a white woman on them named Shirley, and it had colors. It had, you know, red, yellow, blue, green. And you're supposed to tune the uh, color photography machine in your lab to the colors on the Shirley card. Uh, but because Shirley was a light-skinned woman, I, the machines were tuned to light skin. They were not tuned to dark skin. So the only reason that Kodak changed this and made, uh, made it better for people with darker skin is not because in the 1970s Kodak had some kind of awakening or realized that uh, you know, Sidney Poitier was becoming one of the biggest stars in the world. No, it was because of furniture manufacturers who were complaining that their mahogany and walnut furniture looked muddy in catalogs. Okay, so this is the history of that computer vision is built on. It is not a history of reflection, all right? So let's scale up uh, and let's zoom ahead many, many decades. We know that facial recognition technology does not recognize people with darker skin. We know that 
Uh, this is similar technology embedded in self-driving cars, which use sensors to identify objects in the area around them. Okay, so let's ask. The self-driving cars have to recognize people and avoid the people and slow down and not hit the people. So who is the self-driving car going to recognize as human or not human, right? The self-driving car is going to be better, most likely at recognizing light skin than recognizing dark skin. We already know that self-driving cars do not work well in low light conditions. They don't work well in rain or in snow. I'm pretty sure that should these death machines ever get legalized, uh, they're going to disproportionately affect people of color. And we just don't need that. We do not need two-ton killing machines ro roaming around and, uh, and hitting people of color more often than lighter skinned people. Um, I, can, I can add to that from a policy and a law perspective. So I think certainly in the policy arena, one of the things that many of us have is a lack of imaginary, right? So if we look back to the 9-11 commission that was a report after the attack, the federal government identified three issues to why that attack came happened. The, the first one was that um, the United States could not imagine a world where people did not love them. Therefore, they weren't looking for this threat. Um, from bin Laden. The second one was ma managerial capability. And then the third one was a lack of action plan. So if we now think about in terms of algorithmic driven society, I often talk about us as uh, digital citizens with an analog um, imagination. If we now think about the fact that Facebook, which is a social network, can give people the ability to, to advertise homes, you get into this tricky legal issue of lack of imaginary. There are no safeguards to stop the drop down menus that, that um, computer scientists have offered the uh, two people that want to give homes to limit those homes to black people that's when you kind of come into my arena because once you once you start limiting um uh, once you start limiting the possibilities to black people resources to black people ai for the people reddit i cannot remember the name of your organization but all you know we're all going to become activated right and it's explaining this to lawmakers, which is where I spend, and policymakers, where I spend the most of my day, because I'm trying to let them know that there are computer scientists that have no understanding of the 1968 civil rights law who are designing systems that then drive the way that our society has been built. But if we're going to be a society of laws, then we also need lawmakers that understand how from an algorithmic optimization point of view, getting the consumer to the pro to their desired product is the goal of that algorithm. The desired product may not be to uh, the desired choice may not be to offer that to a, a black person. And we see this historical discrimination in housing that goes back to redlining. And then the fact that black people were property, why the hell would a, would, would a piece of chattel need a house? There was no imaginary even then that we would own anything. And the reason I bring up that example is HUD under um, President Trump actually took Facebook to court over this. These are the types of case studies that I have to go in and communicate um, in my in kind of my daily work. But beyond that, when I'm speaking with what I consider to be critical computer scientists, as I would consider you all, these are the real world impacts of the of the of the um of the products that are created in labs, but those labs don't just sit in the academy, which we can go and argue should be a site for the public good. They also sit in industry. And so as somebody who sat in industry where they're literally like, we need to increase shareholder value, um, and that is our primary task, Increasing shareholder value has no history with defending the rights of black and brown people. Therefore, 
if if that's not going to be an if that's not going to be a driving force it kind of gets back to what i was saying initially about how ai for the people perceives itself in the field we are very firmly guided by the black feminist canon, both here in the United States and black feminists um, on the continent at Reddit. I'm so happy that you uplifted our sisters in your work because those are the people that I'm looking to, to help decide um, this future. But, but there is no, I mean, I go in and I say this and I've been saying this for 10 years and people are still surprised people are still and so that's why i so appreciate that this is a multi-prong assault which is actually being led by black and women of color most of the people in this field doing this work and taking the hits i feel like i, I can never come on to any of these types of talks without speaking about our sister Timnit Gebru and the fact that she was doing this research within Google and lost her job as a as a result of it um, shows that not only does this work need to be done but we ourselves are in peril and we ourselves may not have places to work because we ourselves are looking for the world to be a better place not just in the analog but in in the digital also yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I'll i echo my, my fellow panelists and you, Sunny. Um, I think it absolutely is the case that AI is doing a lot more harm. I don't think that, well, I hope that's not disputable, I guess. If it is, I'm happy to, to have this conversation with someone, right? It only really takes just enumerating, you know, what are some of the worst harms, um, including death, that it has caused, and what are some of the best things that it has done, right? And it's very easily, um, uh, it's very easy to see which which bucket people fall in. Do they fall in the people who get the benefits bucket or do they fall in the people who are harmed and whose lives and uh, livelihoods are put in danger bucket, right? So I think that that is the case. I do want to expand this a little bit, right? Because um, it's not just AI technology. So um, I hope you don't mind that I'm putting in the spotlight, Sunny, but Sunny has a, a really wonderful keynote at Crypto this past summer that I watched and then I made everyone around me watch uh, <laughs> that that also talks about sort of the harms of crypto, right, which is not always, you know, uh, related to necessarily to AI. And it's the same thing, right? You just see the exact same things happening there as well. And I really appreciated something that Sandy said during this talk that I just I screamed when I heard it, where, where he said, you know, academia research is now uh, free corporate research. And I was like, that is exactly right. Free corporate research is what we've been doing. Um, and, I, and I really appreciate that. I don't think these things are uh, kind of unrelated, right? That a lot of the kind of knowledge generation that happens in academia within AI and other you know, science is in service of you know, large uh, tech corporations and not um, you know, literally everyone else, right? I think that these things are necessarily related. But to step back even more, I think that this is true of a lot of innovations as well, right? Let's look at, let's say, uh, medicine. Um, even now, medicine, who does it work for, right? There's a lot of things that impact um, uh, yeah, people assigned female at birth, right? That we just, we know nothing about them. We know close to nothing about them. And I wonder if that would have been the case if it was something that impacts, let's say everyone, right? There's a lot of things that impact um, uh, trans and non-gender uh, conforming individuals where we, we have embarrassingly uh, little positive things to contribute as a, as a sort of as a field. And if you step back, you know, 50 years, 100 years, right? Then that contrast becomes more and more and more stark. And the reason why I want to bring up that a lot of sort of innovations and fields and, and positive things that we've been able to contribute have been um, in service of those who already have a lot of power and often um, at the cost of marginalized groups, right? Like for, for instance, in medicine, you know, we've experimented on black bodies. That's just like where we begin to see if something works, right? Um, when it comes to um, things that disproportionately impact uh, marginalized groups, let's say tuberculosis, the medication that we have for it is not something that we would tolerate if it was impacting, you know, other groups of people at all, right? It's like an incredibly um, embarrassingly outdated medication that we have for this um, for this disease, right? And the reason why I bring this up is not to equate what's happening with AI with everything else, because I think it's that's a slippery slope. You can sort of say, well, everything is broken, so I guess that's okay. That's not why. The reason why I bring it up is to say that we've made progress in other areas, right? And we can kind of look to other areas and see how we've been able to sort of mitigate some of those harms. 
Um, and three things stand out to me there. One is just raising awareness, right? Everyone here is doing that. Um, just raising awareness on the fact that like maybe the things that you see in the news are maybe some of the more positive things, but there's some real genuine harm that disproportionately falls on certain groups of people. So really bringing that to light, using art, using stories, using our research, using whatever it is that we want to build, right? I think that's incredibly important. The second thing is, my gosh, regulation. No one is going to self-regulate. Come on. <laughs> just Can we just, well, <laughs> I feel like we've been stuck in this conversation for so long and it's like there's no there's no remedy to this there's no you know like approximation to this we just got to regulate okay can we just keep that conversation moving okay so so that is incredibly important and the third thing which is the area where you know I, I I've been trying to spend most of my time is just reclaiming this right I think that um you know academia which is the field that I'm in and that I you know I've been invested in since you know I could identify what it was, um, is currently, you know, not really in service of all of society, right? I think that it's in service of a specific sector, and I would like to um, help change that as uh, to the best of my abilities. And so that will involve changing academia as it stands, right? I think right now there's an incredible amount of uh, 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 boundary policing between fields, uh, gatekeeping of people who get to be at the seat, right, that we really need to change. So uh, some of the work that we're doing through Black and AI with Tamni Gebru and other people is, is that. It's, uh, Black and AI is not only about academia, but, but it is also focused on academia. And it's also reclaiming what we consider to be computer science research, right? Um, I've been in situations where, you know, I gave a very kind of technical talk, I put this in quotations, uh, and at the end of it, uh, someone was like, so you're an activist, huh? And it wasn't, they didn't mean it as a compliment. Okay, I could tell that they didn't mean it as a compliment. And so I realized that the reason why they, they thought that was because the set of questions I was looking at were, were questions that impact um, uh, people living in poverty. Right. And so and so I kind of patiently explained to this person, I was like, look, actually, you know, you have colleagues here who work on questions like, let's say, ad auctions. They go through a very similar process, actually, from a technical perspective in terms of how they formulate the question. You know, they identify kind of a technical question to ask here. You know, they do the, the work and then they translate it and they just you know, present it in a seminar like I have. But because where I started from was, you know, individuals that are living in poverty rather than, you know, some 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 other thing that felt familiar to this person because of that immediately I was sort of labeled okay this person's an activist meaning you know you you, you don't deserve to be here as a, as a scholar that was what I was perceiving and so I think reclaiming that is is also in that way is also uh, going to be an important role so yeah so those three things awareness regulation and uh, and reclaiming I think are things that I've I've been able to pick up from um, other fields that also have had um, similar problems. Thank you. Um, yeah, really thoughtful and interesting responses. Um, so we have a question here about um, healthcare, since you mentioned healthcare a little bit. And, um, you know, the same way that Meredith kind of described the, um, the history of photography, uh, discrimination bias in healthcare also has a, a long history as well. Um, <clears throat> And so the question is about the use of algorithms in healthcare, for example, for kidney function, pulmonary function tests, and risk for heart disease. Um, and um, oh, this is by um, Angela Zhang. Um, and so sometimes uh, this is based on just flat out racism, and sometimes it's based, um, um, well, actually, maybe more than sometimes. And, um, and so, I guess the, the point that's being brought, brought up is a bit subtle, but it's that um, what, what ends up happening sometimes is that because of the bias, because of the awareness of the bias, sometimes people try to overcompensate for that and, and uh, do more aggressive treatments. And so you're kind of in this like, you know, crazy situation where the, the, the algorithms are biased and may miss uh, you know, may, may miss diseases in people of color or marginalized groups. And because of this, then what some people are trying to do is to overcompensate for that and be more aggressive, which will cause a whole other kinds of questions um, or uh, other kinds of problems. So, um, so the question is, what are your thoughts about AI, algorithms, machine learning and healthcare and, and you know, if there's what we should do about it? Yeah, if anybody wants to start. One of the recommendations, and this isn't um, just 
focused on health, but, th but this, this might be helpful, is that algorithmic decision making systems should not be the final decision maker in life or death situations. So in the field of healthcare, having an algorithmic system and a colleague of mine when I was at Data and Society actually found that in algorithmically driven healthcare settings, um, all people had worse outcomes because what was happening was the, um, first of all, doctors who tended to be white and male would decide that the computer had made the right choice, no matter what they had trained themselves to do, no matter what they knew, no matter their level of experience, there was this de deference to the math, which is what I think Meredith speaks about so beautifully um, in Artificial Unintelligence. And if you hadn't read it, then your unintelligence, you probably should read it. Um, but this, this kind of uh, bias towards computers. And so in a situation like uh, the kidney, I um, the, 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 the kidney one that's been brought up as a diagnostic tool, my recommendation would be look at what that tool is recommending as, as a course of treatment, and then compare that to not only your own case history, but look specifically at the patient and what would be best for the patient. Because the issue with Black people in healthcare is that it's not just when algorithms are used. We are given way more aggressive and wrong, aggressive treatments. We are much more likely to be misdiagnosed. If you know anything about the, um, the uh, I, I don't even know the proper uh, natal space, the prenatal space, black women are more likely to die. And I always tell a story. Um, I, I have two children who I'm not really allowed to speak about on social media, according to them. I speak about them all the time. Just don't tell them. They totally won't watch this. But when I was having my second son, um, the doctor went to get a coffee as I was delivering. And when I came back and, and the nurse had delivered a healthy baby, the doctor then shouted at me for delivering in a way that was more dangerous. So think about that. Was I really being seen as a human? I was literally as close to death as a woman can get because that's what childbirth is about. That's why it's a big deal. And I was not given the same type of treatment and care because I am racialized as Black. Right. So I guess a way of not answering your question, but um, answering and blame the journalist and me, we can do that. But, you know, the way of not answering the question by answering is that in healthcare settings, I am really worried about um, algorithmic diagnostic tools, not just because they are going to be inherently anti black and um, no, and that's the name of the book I'm writing. I, I'm never smart on these things. I'm writing a book called Automated Anti Blackness. Anyway, we can talk about that in a different question, but not because they're going to be inherently anti-Black, but also because they're often deferred to as the last thing. So if your if your response is going to be the kidney thing says that I should do two two uh, you know shots, but I know that the kidney thing is racist, so I'm you know so I'm going to do ten shots. My intervention would be don't rely on the algorithm look at what the kidney thing is telling you to do and then find out if it's real because the thing we're not saying here is the over marketing and over selling of these technologies they don't always do what they're said to do there was a great paper that came out um, from a uh, computer scientist at princeton last year that was entitled how to how to spot ai snake oil like we don't even really know if that thing works um, I know when I was at Google, people were being, and I think may still be the case, I haven't looked recently, black people were being tagged as gorillas, yet it was called images, it was called Google image, you know, so um, I would, I, th that would be my best non-answer um, answer, but I'd be very suspicious of any doctor that, that deferred to the machine uh, to, to treat me, and suspicious of doctors generally, given medical racism, but again, different Zoom. Anybody else? Um, Meredith? Yeah, or... I'll just, I'll add a really quick note. So um, there was actually a discussion that we were having yesterday here at Berkeley and a graduate student here, Wonky, made a point that I loved. I was like so excited when he said this, but he made some, uh, he, he basically said, you know, it was something to the, I'm, I'm going to do a bad job uh, describing this, but he said something to the effect of like, he was talking about mental health and therapy in particular. And he said, well, you know, the point of a therapist is not to spit out a bunch of labels to you, right? And I thought that was an excellent point, right? Because in much of healthcare, maybe even all of it, right? It's not just about like, 
correctly diagnosing something, although of course that's that's it's extra. extra um, is that just me? And or? so I, I'm oh, sorry. Sorry, you cut off for a little bit, at least on my end. I don't know if that's my uh, end. Or... It might have been. My internet has been a little bit spotty. Uh, but I was saying that I think the point of healthcare, um, uh, mental health care certainly, but also, you know, just really healthcare more generally, uh, the point is not to just spit out a bunch of labels at you, right? To accurately diagnose something and that's that, right? It's not, we think of it in this very discreet way. But of course, we know that people's experiences really matter and the process really matters, right? And I thought that therapy was a very particularly salient example, right? Where it's not like, you show up and someone tells you, oh, I know, I know what, what's going on here. You have X, right? And then you just walk out and that's the end. That's, that's not going to solve anything. And so um, I think it's important to, to keep that context in mind. Oh, ready? I have so much to say about this, uh, specifically regarding therapy. Uh, so my parents were therapists and uh, actually part of therapy is about developing labels because that's how you I uh, convince the healthcare companies to pay for the therapy, right? So like therapists are actually really good at figuring out what is the label that is going to allow the person to get the maximum amount of treatment given their healthcare situation. And then they have to like match that up with, uh, you're absolutely right that like, it's not about the labels, like it's about treating the whole person. But you have to do this like complicated calculus of like, what's wrong with this person? How much do, how much treatment do I think they need? And what is their healthcare going to pay for? Uh, so it's, it's so complicated. Um, there's also an article in the New Yorker this week about the uh, failure of talk therapy. Um, maybe it's a New York magazine actually, which is pretty, or failure of text therapy. Talk therapy is good. Text therapy, highly problematic. Um, but so let's go back to the kidney stuff. So unsurprisingly, uh, I went historical on the, uh, on the kidney thing. Uh, so the uh, EGFR measure, uh, which is the kidney diagnostic that we're talking about, is the measure that's used to determine when you get on the kidney transplant list, uh, which is generally about at... 20. So you can have, uh, you get onto the transplant list at 20% kidney function if you're white. If you're black, you get onto the kidney transplant list at about 15 or 15% 15 because many, many years ago, there was a paper in a medical journal that said that black people have uh, increased muscle mass relative to other people. And therefore, uh, the equation that you use to figure out EGFR is different, okay? So this idea of black muscle mass dates back to slavery. It dates back to the fetishization of the black body and black strength because you could profit from a stronger uh, black person when you are selling them as chattel, which is horrifying. Right? But we have this fetishization that got turned into math and people believed it because it was math and because like, oh, well, it's just the math, you know? But we should challenge these things because some of them are not real. And yes, people do have different amounts of muscle mass, but it is not about race. It's about muscle mass, right? Uh, we don't actually have good ways of measuring people's muscle mass. Like, I don't know if anybody on this call actually knows how much muscle mass they have. You probably know your BMI, but like, who knows their muscle mass? Um, and so getting on the transplant list at 20% versus 15% is a big determinant of whether or not you're going to get a kidney because it takes a long time. Uh, to wait for a kidney to show up on the transplant list. Uh, there have been all kinds of crazy, uh, crazy ways that people have tried to work on the system. Uh, I met somebody one time who was working on an algorithm that would determine your future uh, social value to make a different way of ordering people on the transplant list. So if, uh, if you were going to be of great utility to society in the future, like you were going to be predicted to live a long time and make a lot of money, then they were saying, okay, you should move up 
the list. And if you were predicted to not live very long after the transplant or not to make a lot of money, then you would go further down the list, which is crazy because who are the people who are predicted to live longer? Well, that's white people because of access to healthcare, not because of anything inherent about race. So just like deeply problematic all over the place. Um, so this, the GFR calculation is one that we should just throw out. Um, but uh, there are other kinds of diagnostic situations where uh, color does matter. So for example, in diagnosing skin cancer. So one of the things that uh, doctors and nurses need to do a better job of is looking at what does skin cancer look like on uh, people who are different colors because for a very long time, there was an idea that uh, black and brown people don't get skin cancer because they have too much melanin. And so uh, nobody looked for skin cancer and you know, skin cancer does look different depending on the color of the skin. Uh, so that's a time when we might want to think about skin color and medicine. And obviously none of our diagnostic algorithms are set up currently to deal with all of these nuances. Uh, so this is why I think we should not rush into uh, transforming our current diagnostic mechanisms into algorithms and we should just slow it down and push back against techno chauvinism and uh, not get too carried away with using AI when we don't need to use AI. Yeah, could not agree more. Um, so I have about like half a dozen more questions I would love to ask you. There's a bunch of questions in the Q&A. We're running out of time. So I'm going to pick one from the Q&A um, to ask, especially because we have Meredith here. Um, and the question was, uh, has anyone watched Coded Bias? Um, and what are your comments? So I think it's a great opportunity for us to mention Coded Bias and to talk a little bit about it in the next few minutes that are left. I think everybody should watch Coded Bias, not just because I'm in it, but because it's an awesome film. Uh, that's my short answer. Yeah. Ready to move I don't know if you've had a chance to see it yet, but or if you yeah, haven't. Agreed. Definitely watch it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I would definitely agree. And it, I think I love the way, as somebody who's interested in narrative change, I love the way it reframes who the experts are, can be and should be. Yeah, and I think it's a you know it's a great example you know like you mentioned Mutali of of the importance of of media and art and and you know doing things beyond just like the technical papers but also you know sort of branching out right and collaborating with you know with different areas as well so yeah that's it that's foundational to our work everything is research driven but our you know. We, our uh, metrics are around how much have we impacted the the um, public conversation, which is completely opposite to um, academia. I know, but there, I mean, there's some, there's some, I'll say some great ideas in the academy um, that that I think are worth lifting. Specifically, uh, those of us who are justice practitioners and those of us who. Who, who want to be able to validate to people that you shouldn't just use technology all the time. I think there's something very powerful about somebody like uh, Kathy O'Neill, who has a PhD in math saying, this is a math. Right. Right. Yeah. Great, so thank you again, um, you know, to all of you for joining. This was a great panel. I'm just really, really excited and happy that I got the chance to, you know, to talk to you for this time. I wish we would have scheduled longer actually. Um, maybe next time that's what that's what we'll do. Um, but yeah, we're we're out of time. Um, and thank you to everybody for for it, attending. All right. Thank you so much. This is great. Bye bye. Right. Thank you.